Welcome to Crossroads Online. My name is Christy, and I'm so glad you're worshiping with us today. Before we get started, we'd love for you to take a moment to share this service with a friend or family member. Just send them the link or share the video on Facebook. We would love to hear from you. You can let us know you're here on the Crossroads app through the communicator card. Let us know how you'd like to connect and how we can be praying for you this week. Before we begin our time with worship through singing, let's read from Matthew 6, 28 through 33. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let's worship together.
At Crossroads, we'd love to help you take the next step in your spiritual journey. And so we have a series of classes and experiences called the Equipping Track to help you grow. If you're new or relatively new to Crossroads, I'd love to invite you to Next Step, Sunday, May 23rd at 6.30. During this informal Zoom call, you can learn about Crossroads, meet some of our staff, as well as learn how to get connected and take the next step in your spiritual journey. Register online on the app or at xr.church slash next step. Join me for a night of vision to discover what a year of Movement Makers could do for you. Movement Makers is a school of discipleship. This year-long, life-changing experience is for people of any age, background, vocation, or season of life. The purpose of the Movement Makers is to provide you with the opportunity to be transformed through encountering God, being discipled, and making disciples, and learning to fully live on mission in our city, nation, and the nations of the earth. Throughout the school, you'll deepen your walk with God, learn to walk in lifelong fruitfulness, and discover your unique purpose. Movement Makers is a combination of prayer, worship, and teaching in a hands-on learning environment that allows you to not only be hearers of the word, but doers. This time together can be catalytic in establishing kingdom values and empowering people to live fully fruitful lives for Jesus no matter what stage of life. So come on May 24th at our Pittsburgh West Hub at 6.30, ready to worship, pray and discern your next steps to growing in lifelong practices that will cause you to burn for Jesus. So here we are, we're with our online Following Jesus class. And tonight we are welcoming new members uh, here at Crossroads Church. We are the family of God on the mission of God. And we're so excited to just welcome the folks that we have with us this evening. And so we will um, take our new member vows. And um, we. so I will ask the question and then all you need to do is answer the question and then um, Bob will pray for us at the end. So do you agree to renounce the spiritual for forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sins? If so, answer, I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. do do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they may present themselves? If so, answer, I do. I, I do. do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, answer, I do. I do. I do. I do. As members of this Crossroads Church, will you faithfully participate in its ministries with your prayers, presence, gifts, and service and witness? If so, answer, I will. I will. I will. I will. Wonderful. Bob, would you pray for us? Absolutely. God, we're just always in awe of how much you love us and continue to love us. And so tonight, as a group, we're just loving you back. We are committed to following you to follow in your son Jesus and, and giving our hearts to him, to make disciples who make disciples and to love and obey Christ. And I just thank you for this group and I lift them up to you and let them continue to grow closer to you. And God, we love you with all of our hearts. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> How exciting. Thank you. Before I decided to give my life to Jesus, I stored a lot of bitterness and anger in my heart. My grandma exposed me to God at a young age, but due to the constant family chaos, I drifted away from God. As I got into high school, I was exploring other routes to find comfort that I wasn't getting in my home life. Unfortunately, those outlets included drugs and alcohol. I was embarrassed to come to God for the longest time because I wasn't cleaned up. I knew I was sinning. I knew what God expected from me being a young woman following his heart and I was doing the opposite. The way I carried myself was very poor. I would argue with everybody. I just carried a lot of hurt in my heart towards my family and towards God. And I had so much to express and I didn't know how to. So I kept all that inside. And the way that I projected it was in a very poor way. I had the opportunity in my senior year to go to Encounter when I got there, I honestly 
decided to sign up because I wanted a little vacation away from my house for the weekend, not knowing the benefit it was going to have over my life. When I got there, I always used to tell people I would never cry over anything and I always held in my emotions. And when I got there, I just felt God's presence lift up all the anger and the hurt that I was carrying in my heart and on my shoulders. And just being around so many people who love God and that love you and that care about you, I just felt all that lift off my shoulders and out of my heart. And I really felt God in those two days. Um, the mo more than anything in my life, I felt God the most there at Encounter. And when I came home, my life was going so good for like a good month and um, more issues happened. The plans I had for college failed. Uh, my family situations got even worse. And I had all these big plans for myself of what I was gonna do after high school. And that never happened. It led to me adjusting a lot in my life and adjusting my plans accordingly to um, what God originally had planned for me. After COVID hit, I had people from the church reach out to me wanting me to get involved with church. I began to partake in doing online classes with uh, the church. And then I also wanted to learn how to get involved even more. So I sort of volunteer on Sundays. Um, so I'm constantly getting more involved with God and what he has planned for me. And now the way I carry myself, I'm less angry. I have more patience than I had before. Um, I don't feel the need to defend myself or um, argue with anybody anymore. I'm not that angry, tough girl persona that I took on before I started following Jesus. I think the way that I carry myself and how I perceive myself is way better than it was before I was following Jesus. I definitely have seen the way God has moved in my life. I started reading my Bible more because that is the only book where the author is in love with the reader. So I love learning about God every day and reading my Bible has helped transform my life and how I am as a person and the way that I carry myself. I now see my worth because I find it through Christ now. All the battles and the fights that I faced, I just give to God because I now realize that he already won the battle, so there's no reason for me to waste my energy because he already won the battle. So God has definitely been working in my life, and thank you. As followers of Jesus, our generous giving is an act of worship and obedience to God as we give to him a portion of what he has given to us. And our giving is also what fuels our mission to make disciples who make disciples. The easiest way to give is online at xr.church give or you can mail a check to the address on the screen. Before we give, let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for everything that you have given us. God, your hand is open to us. And Father, we wanna live lives with generous open hands as well. So God, I pray right now that you would bless this act of worship and obedience as we give. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship God through our singing and giving. Whoa.
So we want to take time to pray over the prayer requests that you've submitted through the communicator card and through our prayer center on the app. So let's take a moment and pray together. We have one prayer request for someone's mother named Shirley that she's going into surgery. So Father, we just lift up Shirley to you right now. Father, we pray um, for your healing touch, Jesus. We pray, God, um, that her surgery would go well. And Father, that she would be healed and whole and restore. We pray for a speedy recovery in Jesus' name. And we just pray peace for the family as well. Also, we have another prayer request that Tyler has a CT scan. Tyler has finished chemotherapy two months ago, and they are looking for a complete healing and strength to combat the anxiety and worry. So, Lord God, we just lift up Tyler to you right now, and I pray, Father, um, just for peace as he's waiting on this appointment. I pray for peace, Lord God, um, that he would rest well and know, Lord God, that you are covering him and that you are holding him. Lord God, we do pray together as a church body for a clean CT scan, Father. We curse cancer in the name of Jesus, and God, we proclaim health and life over his body in Jesus' name. Amen. So now we'll just take some time for all of us just to pray and ask God to meet your personal needs. We know that God is a healer and he knows exactly where you need touch. So let's just pray together. Take a couple moments of silence. Father, we're grateful that you know every single need that we have. We're grateful, Lord, that those who are joining us online, though we don't know that they're there, you are intimately aware that they are here with us. And Lord, we know that you hear their prayers. We know, Lord God, that you meet needs. And so, God, we turn over every need to you, every every ailment, Lord God, every um, health issue, every financial issue, every relationship issue. God, you're the restorer and the healer. And so, Father, we thank you in that. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hi, I'm Steve Cordell, lead pastor at Crossroads Church. Hey, does anybody remember the song, We Are Family? It was the theme song for the Pittsburgh Pirates the last time they won the World Series, which was in 23 BC. No, I'm just kidding. 1979. 1979, that's the era in which the TV show, This Is Us, is set. That show is about a family living in Pittsburgh in the 70s and the 80s. The message series that we're in today is titled, This Is Us, and it's about a church family in Pittsburgh called Crossroads Church. We are the family of God on the mission of God. And actually this series is based on John chapter 13 through 17, where Jesus speaks to his disciples one last time before he's crucified. Now the truths he highlights in that talk become the church's family values. Uh, in John 13, Jesus taught us to serve one another and the world. And that's what we do at Crossroads Church. Last week in John 14, we saw that we're to encourage each other to obey Jesus because we love him. And today, we're going to look at John 15. So let's honor the Lord's word as uh, maybe where you are, you can stand as we read together John 15, 1 through 8. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing." If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. 
So if I were to ask you, what does it mean to be a Christian? What would you say? Now, some might say, well, being a Christian means that we believe in God, we try to be a moral person. Others think it means to maybe have an emotional moment or praying a certain prayer you know, after hearing the message. Uh, maybe somebody preaches, hey, Jesus loves you and died for your sin, ask for his forgiveness, and then you'll be saved and you'll escape hell and you'll spend eternity in heaven. Now, I've offered invitations, something like that, at the end of worship services. And over the years at Crossroads, hundreds, maybe thousands of people have prayed uh, to receive Christ. But honestly, I have stopped doing that. I've stopped extending that exact phrase and offering because it's not that it's wrong or false to say, here's the promise of the gospel, pray and receive Christ. I'm just saying that... uh, while people have become Christ followers that way, uh, that God uses all kinds of methods to bring people to Jesus, but that praying the prayer just by itself doesn't communicate the essence of what it means to be following Jesus. When I was in college, I remember being bothered by the fact that uh, in the New Testament, the disciples, disciples really never heard the gospel the way I was presenting it. And they never prayed to receive Christ like we do today. So the question is, when did they become Christians? Well, of course, Jesus had not yet died on the cross and risen again when they first started following him. So I thought, well, okay, these are special cases. These guys live between the Old Testament religion and the new covenant through Jesus. So the way they came into relationship with God worked differently than for everybody else. Or did it? The more I studied the scriptures and I watched God at work in people's lives over the years, uh, I saw that those first disciples came into faith in Jesus really much the same way that we do today. That is by making him the Lord of their lives. Uh, They said yes to whatever Jesus asked them to do. They started with small steps and then they moved on to bigger ones. That They showed their faith in Jesus by continuing to follow him. They absorbed what he taught, and one thing led to another, and a few years later, they were preaching the gospel and leading an expanding movement of followers. And they became so committed to Jesus that all but one of them died as martyrs for their conviction. Now, the New Testament shows that a person can be vitally connected to Jesus without praying a formula prayer, but John 15 tells us that No one can be Jesus' follower without staying deeply connected to him and drawing their life from him. John 15 tells us that Jesus' followers are bonded to him as a branch to the vine. In John 15, 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine. Now, the disciples would have been startled to hear that. They grew up hearing that the nation of Israel was the vine. The Old Testament repeatedly uses the grapevine as a symbol for the people of Israel. In fact, in the temple, there was a massive vine made of solid gold that towered 90 feet high. It was a symbol of the nation. And the people of Israel are called a vine throughout the Old Testament, like in Psalm 80, verses 8 through 11. You, that is God, brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, its mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. So God's people here are called a vine planted by the Lord, and he intended that they would bear fruit for his pleasure. But it didn't work out that way. Even though Israel was planted by the Lord, they didn't stay faithful to him. They didn't produce the fruit that God was looking for and that God desired. In Isaiah 5, verses 3 to 4, the Lord says, And now you inhabitants of Jerusalem and the people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard than I have not done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? God was looking for fruit from Israel, and he didn't get it. So Jesus became the true vine, and his followers 
we are the branches. So Jesus says that God expects us to bear fruit. In verses one and two, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it would be even more fruitful. And then in verse eight, he says, this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So fruit repeats all through this passage. What does Jesus mean by fruit? I mean, we're expected to bear fruit, so what is he expecting of us? Well, I believe he's talking about at least two types of fruit. The first is the fruit of love. And I say this because just a few verses later, in verse 12, Jesus says, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. And this is what Jesus is expecting. So right after saying, I'm looking for fruit, he says, this is what I'm expecting, love one another. In fact, in Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit, it says, is love, joy, and peace. So the first expression of the fruit of the Spirit, of, of the, the expression of the Holy Spirit in us is love. Now, these are identifying markers, of course, of what it means to be bonded to Christ like a branch to the vine. When we're bonded to Jesus, the Jesus who loved us so much that he died for us, well then, how can we not love other people? If we know personally and intimately the God of the universe, the God our Father, God is love. So when we know him, how can we not love other people? So, a key aspect of producing fruit in us is love. And another kind of fruit that we can expect when we're bonded to Jesus is that we can help produce new followers of Jesus. In other words, when we love other people, we want to help them find their way back to God. In John chapter 4, verses 35 and 36, Jesus says, Behold, I tell you, Raise your eyes and observe the fields that they are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life. There it is again. The fruit that Jesus is looking for is his followers being fruitful and connecting others to him. That's what happens when we love other people. We're going to want them to find their way back home to God. Last week, my wife Linda uh, flew to Texas to visit her father and stepmom for the first time since before the pandemic. And after a great visit, uh, she was getting ready to return home. And I was anxious for her to get home on Monday night. But when she got to the gate, she was told her flight was delayed for 45 minutes. And then she was told it was delayed an hour and a half. And then they had to change gates to another place. And then uh, several hours late, they boarded the plane. Finally, they boarded the plane just in time for thunderstorms to roll through the area, severe ones. And so they sat on the plane, ultimately for three hours, waiting for the thunderstorms to pass. And all through this time, Linda was texting me updates and, uh, and uh, I was trying to encourage her, but the storms didn't pass. And finally, uh, the plane returned back to the terminal and the flight was canceled. So here it was nearing midnight, when Linda called me, uh, she was in a, a long line that ended up being like two hours long of people trying to get alternate flights and scrambling for a way to get back to Pittsburgh. And I could hear the fatigue and discouragement in her voice. So when she called me, I got on the computer and I went to work trying to find her a flight back. And I tried three times booking a flight for her for the next day. But each time, by the time I entered my credit card information, the flight was snatched by somebody else and disappeared. So I finally ended up getting her a seat after a number of tries, uh, got her back quite late, and I knew that she was really desperate to get home. So I thought, all right, well, that's one option. I've got that one, but now I'm gonna try to look for a better one. And so I, I went online again. I found and booked another flight uh, that was getting her back a few hours earlier. I, we, you know, we were literally spending hundreds of dollars, uh, but you know, that was okay. I didn't really care how much it costs. I just wanted for her to get back home. I knew she really wanted to get back home. I really wanted her back home. And so it didn't matter uh, how much money we're spending at that point. Um, and we were, we were gonna make that happen. So the next day she got in the plane to come back home. And guess what? Thunderstorms came up again. And the plane was delayed and sitting on the terminal. Terminal shut down. Uh, by this time, 
you know, she was just really wanting to get out of there, but she finally made it. They, they did take off and she got home. And as she got home, uh, of course, we were delighted that she made it back. And I was thinking about how determined I was to get her back home. And I thought, you know, I'm not going to bed. It might be 1.30 in the morning, but I'm not going to bed until I know that she has a way back home. What if I, what if each of us had that same kind of determination, that same kind of urgency about helping the people in our region find their way back home to God. It's even more important. Jesus said he came to seek and save the lost. And when we're deeply bonded to him, we'll share his mission. That's fruit. That's what Jesus is looking for with, with us. When we read a passage like John 15, it's uh, natural for us to ask ourselves, hey, do I have fruit? And has love been growing in me over this past year? Does it matter to me that there are thousands of people within a short drive of this room uh, that don't have life and are going to face eternity apart from Christ? Well, we might feel good about what we see in us. We might feel like, oh, maybe I should be more fruitful. If we feel like, hey, there's not quite enough fruit in my life, what am I supposed to do about, do about that? The answer is not hey, get busy and work harder. Jesus says something entirely different. When it comes to producing fruit, what he says is, remain in me. John 15, verses 4 to 5, he says, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So I've got a branch right here. Um, I've heard Francis Chan use this illustration before. Uh, And uh, so if we all worked together, persistently, really hard, could we make this branch bear fruit? Uh, the answer is no. I mean, we might be able to tape an apple on here or something like that, but no, we can't make this branch produce fruit. The only branch this, this the only way this branch can can bear any fruit is if it's attached, in this case, to a tree. Jesus guarantees us we cannot bear fruit unless we abide in Him, unless we remain in Him. And if we do remain in Him. He guarantees us that we will have fruit. So see, the key to producing the kind of love and urgency for others to come to Christ isn't in just about our effort. It's remaining in Christ. So how do we do that? Well, notice Jesus doesn't say that we need to remain in church or remain in Bible study or remain in prayer. No, he says we need to remain in him. If we think remaining in Jesus means sitting quietly alone and meditating in prayer, then most of the time we won't be remaining because we can't do that all the time, right? Uh, Remaining in Jesus or staying bonded to him means I just don't do anything without him, that my whole existence is connected to him. One of the most transformational realizations I've had in the last 10 years is the awareness of doing each day with Jesus, not for him. You see, doing things for Jesus uh, can mean that he's at a distance watching, right? Like, I'm performing for you, Jesus. But that's not what he asks. Jesus says that he will be with us always. And that's why we can remain in him, unless we choose to wander off. Remaining in Jesus means depending on him moment by moment. So as I go through each day now, my goal is to try to be aware that Jesus is present in the ups and downs. He's celebrating with me when things are going well. And when I'm having a problem I have to deal with, I don't have to just do it on my own. I don't have to think, well, what am I going to do about this? I think, all right, Lord Jesus, how are we going to handle this? What do you want to be doing in this this instance? Of course, Remaining in Jesus also involves spending time with him in personal worship and with others in public worship. It is those quiet moments, those moments where we can connect 
with him and with people in his community, these deepen our bond with him for sure. And it's, it's really important for us to spend that time in prayer and scripture on a daily basis. But that's not the sum total of what it means to remain. See, Jesus gives us a heads up about remaining in him, like a branch to the vine. He tells us, if you're doing this, if you're producing fruit, you will be pruned. <laughs> in verse 2 of John 15, Jesus says, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So being pruned doesn't mean getting wrinkled like a prune. It means uh, that it's a technique of refining and of cleansing us. Pr pruning is a technique that vineyard owners use to increase the yield of their vines. During the winter season, they cut back the branches of what looks like a healthy plant. And it might seem cruel and destructive, but actually, it allows the energy of the vine to flow and to produce more fruit in what remains. And God will do the same thing in us as people. Uh, you know, we would expect for him to operate on us and cut away sin from our lives, but pruning is not just about eliminating, you know, sin and disobedience. The Lord will cut away parts of our lives that might even look good, might look healthy, in order that we become even more fruitful. Because a tree that's never been pruned looks good. It's got a lot of leaves, but it's, and it's got a lot of branches growing. But the problem is it doesn't produce enough fruit unless the deadwood's cut away and, and then fruit's gonna grow much better. So the Lord might cut away even good things in our lives. Could it be that God is using COVID to prune us as believers and as a church? COVID was a forced pruning of our schedules, wasn't it? I mean, I've heard many people say that when the shutdown happened, that they actually enjoyed the slower pace for a while. They connected more with some other family and each other. So now the challenge is going to be, will I fill up my life again with all the other things? Remember, we can't remain in Jesus, though, if a thousand other things are distracting us. Let's be careful about what we replant into our lives. Jesus says that the Lord prunes every branch. British preacher Charles Spurgeon said, all fruit-bearing saints must feel the knife. Jesus says our only options are to be either discarded or pruned, one or the other. Uh, when we're pruned, we become more reliant on Jesus, the, our, the vine, for our life and our strength. And the process of pruning cuts away everything else so that we can love him and trust him fully. So let's ask ourselves, what's is something draining life from my relationship with Jesus? Is there something that loosens my connection with him? Let the Lord prune that. You know, people who grow and prevail, who produce fruit, do so not just because they believe more sincerely, but because they bond more deeply with Jesus. So let's allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us right now about how he might be pruning us to remain in Jesus. Let's bow before him. Lord Jesus, in this moment of reflection, we ask you to, by your Spirit, speak to our hearts. Lord, where there are activities that have been unhelpful energy wasters, Lord, we pray you would help us to receive your pruning. Where there's been disobedience, Lord, we pray that you would give us a heart of repentance, that we remain in you. Lord, we want to be deeply bonded, deeply connected to you. And yes, Lord, meet us in times of prayer and in scripture. I pray today, Lord, for each person who's hearing my voice, Lord, to answer and to hear that call from your spirit. It says, come in a little higher, come in a little further, come in a little deeper. Lord, bond us to you so that love flows naturally out of us because we're connected to your heart of love. Bond us deeply to you so that we can share in your mission, Lord, so that we can produce fruit, that we can be people, give you glory. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. I give you glory for all you brought me through And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do And 
I'm moving forward to follow after you And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do Your presence is an open door And we want you been great worshiping with you today online and we'd love to pray for you so messages on facebook or live chat with our prayer team on our website and let us know how god's at work in your life as well we'd love to hear how he's answering your prayer and uh, if you're comfortable now we'd love to see you in person uh, at one of our locations as we've gathered together there's a tremendous sense of god's spirit with us as we pray and worship him together so now receive this benediction. We're done being the church right here online. It's time for us to be the church in where we live, work, play, 
and learn. So go with the love and power of Jesus to make disciples. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.